Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Glad for those of you that are able to join us on live stream this evening. We have finally come back on live stream. Been having some technical difficulties with live stream, so we're hoping tonight will be the night that those things will kind of work out. We're trying some different things here in our studio here to make it work on live stream. And of course, this will be the time that we will be beginning. Uh, I believe it's 4 p.m. Eastern time in the United States at this particular time, maybe a couple of minutes late coming on the air here as we make sure everything is working out just fine here. We are looking at a very in-depth look at the Vatican's role, politics, scripturally, since 1993. Of course, we can go back much further than that, but I wanted to just bring out some things that are happening, especially things that have been happening just since 2016. But in order to be able to recap so that you can see just how significant the Vatican has played in the politics of the world, a global politics, and Israel as well. Uh, so the title, title of our uh, news broadcast tonight, Pope Francis Leading the World. Let's go on, let's get right into this uh, broadcast this evening. Anyway, Joel Bainerman, uh, Joel Bainerman uh, passed away some years back uh, now at a very early age. It has been believed by uh, Barry Chamish, who is an Israeli journalist, uh, that he was actually murdered for the things that he was revealing about different stories, especially when it comes to the Pope of Rome and the issues that are going on there. But Joel Bainerman wrote uh, in one of his articles, you can see his uh, website, uh, joelbainerman.com. Barry Chamish wrote, uh, actually had quoted uh, Joel Bainerman in this particular art article on his website, redmoonrising.com. says, first, you have to realize that for centuries, the Vatican has attempted to obtain control of Jerusalem, which started with the Crusades for, for them to convince the world that the Messiah they put on the world stage is, coming, is, is going to be accepted as genuine. They need to perform this play in the old city. The story of this production is that this Messiah will merge the three monotheistic religions, usher in peace and harmony in the world, and solve the Middle East conflict. The location for this production will be in none other than the old city of Jerusalem. Now keep this in mind. Joel wrote this back in, I'm not sure exactly what the date was. I want to say it was probably written around 1995, 1996 in that era there. And of course, many of us are very much familiar, especially in the times, uh, the, the days here in the last couple of years, just how much the Vatican uh, has been trying to unite the world's religions, the three monotheistic religions, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews, as well as uh, getting control of the old city there. Pope Francis has been a leader in making this happen, uh, he, and he has been very successful. He has gotten the uh, Jewish Congress to sign on on December the 3rd. They signed an agreement with the Vatican uh, in, in bringing the ties together. He has brought the Muslims together. He has, uh, he has brought basically all the world religions. He's even brought the Protestants back in together. Uh, the, the, the Mother Rome, we might say, the whore of Revelation that it speaks of, that has harlots for daughters, all the daughters have come home. The daughters also include the uh, Muslim religion, Islamic religion. So they have been very successful in doing just this. And of course, to bring peace in the Middle East, right now there is yet to be peace, but this is the whole purpose of this act, as Joel Bainerman calls it, a stage it must be set here, He's got to be able to see that there's conflict going on to become the true peacemaker. And of course, Joel Bainerman being Jewish, he did not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And I can understand why in regards to the way the Vatican portrays what uh, true Christianity really is. So therefore, Joel certainly did not accept it and was trying to get the Jewish people to be aware of just how wicked and evil the Vatican really is there. Moving right along, Joel said here, uh, this he brings out the things that were happening in a chronological order here. He says, in 1992, the story of the Catholic Church attempt to uh, abscond the, the, uh, the old city of Jerusalem from the Jews began in July of 1992. According to the information on the Foreign Ministry's website, literally from the moment the new rabbin led uh, the Labor government took over from Yitzhak Shamir's defeat Likud party, secret talks 
with the Vatican and the State of Israel began. We're talking about Yitzhak Rabin, when Yitzhak Rabin became the Prime Minister of Israel. And of course, yes, he immediately uh, was already in secret talks with the Vatican. And it was Joel Bannerman, Barry Chamish, uh, that exposed this, as, as well as the Italian newspaper La Stampa had re re recorded this, uh, this private, these secret meetings, we should call them. Anyway, uh, he goes on to state here that... Um, uh, what, what, press, uh, what precipitated these secret talks, who arranged these talks, and why? Why were they kept secret from the Israeli public, and what was the end result of these agreements? Where, uh, where do they stand today? The entire subject of Israel bilateral relations with the Vatican is intentionally kept locked away in secrecy, Joel states. It's no wonder that nobody in Israel knows much about Israel-Vatican relations, as it is never, ever reported on the Israeli press. There is very few, even today, that say anything about it. We say it here at Israeli News Live. Uh, Gulio Meati, who's uh, very much an advocate uh, speaking against what the Vatican is doing to the Jewish people, he is another journalist that does that as well. And, uh, and by the way, Israeli News Live, we are a legal business licensed uh, news company. We are licensed in, uh, in Europe as well as we are also on uh, the books in the United States as well. So we're not just a fly-by-night YouTube uh, wannabe journalistic uh, business. We are a real business, journalist company. Going on now as we continue on here, Daniel, uh, excuse me, September 1993 says here, on uh, the 10th of September, just three days before the signing of the Oslo Accords uh, in Washington, the Italian newspaper La Stampa reported that the foreign minister, Shimon Perez, concluded a secret deal with the Vatican to hand over sovereignty of Jerusalem's old city to the Vatican. The agreement, and, and it was included in the secret clauses of the Declaration of Principles signed on September 13th, 1993 in Washington, D.C. In the same week, that Israeli foreign minister and chief uh, Oslo architect Shimon Peres signed the Declaration of Principles with Yasser Arafat in Washington. The, Is the Israel Vatican Commission held a special meeting in Israel. Under the Vatican Agreement, the Israelis would give over control of the old city to the Vatican before the year 2000. The plan also calls for Jerusalem to become the second Vatican of the world with all three major religions represented but under the authority of the Vatican. Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel, but the old city will be administered by the Vatican. I wonder why we have, uh, not too long ago, where the, uh, the, uh, the head cardinal uh, for the foreign relations of the Vatican there, uh, Tehran, actually stated there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the sovereignty of these sites are handed over to the Vatican. Now, what's really interesting is during from 1948 to 1967, when the Jordanians had full control over the West Bank and East Jerusalem, no, at no time did the Vatican ever demand sovereignty over these sites in the old city, and neither had they ever called on uh, the old city or, or Jerusalem itself becoming an international city. Why didn't they do this then? Why didn't any of the pontiffs at that time actually call for an international city with Jerusalem at that time? Why is it only that when Israel has control of Jerusalem that this is being done? Again, Joel Bannerman has made it very clear, and of course we realize this ourselves, that the Vatican's desire is to fake a millennial reign. They are trying to bring about a something scripturally that's supposed to happen by biblical prophecy, not by the way that they're trying to do it themselves. And we'll go into it in just a little bit about uh, the prophecy. In fact, we'll go into that next here of Daniel chapter 11, verse 14. So if you have your Bible and want to follow along, it's very interesting right here. In the photograph on here, you see Shimon Perez with Pope John Paul II. And it states here, this is why we put the picture in here, Daniel 11, 14. And in those times, there shall... Uh, shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the children of the violent, which would be also trans the more accurate translation would be sons of the lawless, among thy people, that's Daniel's people, of course, so it's the Jewish people, shall lift themselves up to establish the vision or marry the vision. It's literally what it says in Hebrew, marry the vision, but they shall stumble or they shall fall. 
They will fail. They won't be able to do it. But what's interesting is that Daniel actually sees that the lawless of the children of Israel, or the sons of Israel, will try to establish this vision, try to bring together. What vision? Speaking of Isaiah, the prophecy where it talks about the city of Jerusalem becoming a city where all nations shall flow into it. And it's kind of funny because I've always likened Shimon Perez very much like Ahab. If you go back and remember the story of Ahab, God sent Elijah to tell him that he was going to bring a condemnation upon him because he what? Married Jezebel. Now it wasn't so much that he married a Gentile girl by no means, but what was it? Jezebel brought idolatry into Israel. This is where Jezebel did wrong. It wouldn't even be the fact that Jezebel spoke out publicly, as some people try to say, well, it's a woman trying to put herself up in authority. No, it has nothing to do with that. God allows women to speak with no problem. We had Huldah, the prophetess that spoke for Israel, that even the high priest had to go get her to find out the plans of God. You had Deborah, the judge of Israel. So it's not that God doesn't have women in authority. Sure he does. But the problem that we have here is that Ahab married Jezebel and she brought idolatry into Israel. Now God was going to bring judgment upon Ahab, but he turned his face towards the wall and he wept bitterly in sackcloth and ashes and repentance before the Lord and God accepted the repentance. So he commands Elijah to go back and tell Ahab that he would not bring the judgment upon him because of his repented heart, but he would bring it upon his son. Now the funny thing is, is Shimon Perez is very much like a son of Ahab. And what has he done? He has married idolatry. He has married Jezebel. And the funny thing is, is literally in the Hebraic language in Daniel 11, 14, it says to marry the vision. So what has he done? He's married the Catholic Church and brought idolatry right back into Israel again. Now the funny thing is, if you think about this, my Jewish brothers and sisters from around the world that are watching tonight, keep in mind, Historically, 2,000 years ago, Rome was in control of Israel. And then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman general Titus. The Jewish people were scattered to all the world. Now we're seeing the whole scene reset up again. And once again, Rome is in control of Jerusalem. This stage is being reset. Many of the Jews that considered the possibility that Yeshua, that is Jesus, might be the Messiah, were looking for him to deliver them from the Romans. But the thing is, is Yeshua did not come to deliver them from the Roman particular law of this land because he said, my kingdom is not of this world. But he is coming to deliver his people to get them to the kingdom, the true kingdom. Now, of course, we do know the millennial reign will be here on the earth. That is true. But he's got to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Romans. And they didn't accept him when he came the first time, just like it was with Moses. They never accept Moses the first time he come. But the prophecy does say in Exodus, God says, but they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. That's in Exodus chapter 4, the voice of the latter sign. He says to Moses, if they will not believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Had nothing to do with the physical signs that Moses did by turning the staff to a serpent, nor his hand to leprosy and being restored again. It was speaking of the two witnesses, Moses' second coming on the earth there. Anyway, a lot of things are going on, though. This is what we're going to go into this evening as we look into these prophecies here. A lot of prophetic things that have been happening, biblical things, as well as what is shaping up all over the world by the Vatican's control of practically everything. Looking here, this is an op-ed by Guglio Miotti. It's an Israel National News that came out. A seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. Of course, now after the 1993 accord, that was uh, signed by the Vatican and Israel with the secret meetings with Shimon Peres. Then later, it took a number of years later to be able to get this pulled off, but finally the Pope of Rome gets an official seat there that was under Pope Benedict's uh, reign at that time. And it says, an historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope of, uh, an official seat in, in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have taken place. On Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to also be buried. They gave the Pope of Rome an official seat at the tomb of David, really thus effectively making him the king of Israel. 
Because why? They put his seat at the very burial places of the former kings of Israel, David and Solomon. Therefore, they have now crowned him, and as he wore his fish goddess crown there, at the, uh, in the upper room, in the picture you see on your screen now, he became the king of Israel at that time. No wonder why it says that wicked king of Israel. Many people are looking for a Jewish antichrist. Well, this is the reason why he's actually considered He's officially adopted as a Jew when they crown him king of Israel. So this is what you get when you do that. Now let's move on. Something else Joe Bannerman said that I thought was interesting, I'd like to share with you here. Given the time frame of events that were happening, this was in March of 1995, he says a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome to, to foreign ministry was in Jerusalem is leaked to the radio station Arut Sheba, Israel National News, most of you know it by confirming the handover uh, of Jerusalem to the Vatican. Here's the funny thing. Before I finish, well, let me just finish reading this, and then I'll explain something to you that, to, to prove that this is really true. Two days later, the cable made front page of Hararetz uh, in the widely distributed minutes of a meeting with President Clinton in 1997. Perez ended the cable with the words, as I had previously promised the Holy See. Now, of course, later, Shimon Perez denied that. He said it was a misquoted uh, statement there. It was typographical error. It was saying that they do not get the old city of Jerusalem. But when we were at the, uh, the, the, the uh, Temple Institute, we were going through an official um, uh, tour of the Temple Institute, which, which is for the, they're over the building of the Third Temple. And they stated, officially, their own spokesperson, that Jerusalem is not under Israeli control. Well, if Jerusalem is not under Israeli control, whose control is it under? Well, according to what was leaked here on the cable here, it says that uh, confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. Shimon Perez had already sold out Israel. He had married division, trying to bring Daniel 11, 14. He was one of the sons of the lawless, trying to make the vision come to pass. Very sad, to say the least there. You know, in Obadiah's prophecy, this is a very interesting thing as well. Obadiah prophesies in the first chapter, and, and, and one thing I want you to be able to see here is this video here. Obadiah prophesies, as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. And the funny thing is, here we have Pope Francis here in the upper room. He's in the upper room of the, of the um, uh, right there above King David's tomb in the old city on Mount Zion and having a communion service. This was on Passover 2014. Now, let me take you to the Hebraic version of this, of Obadiah 1.6. No, I'll read it to you again in English. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down, and shall be as though they had not been. Now, you have to kind of back up and go and look, and you'll see in, the, in Obadiah, I believe it's around verse 6 there, that he clearly identifies who this is speaking of. He speaks of it as being Esau, and how that Esau had a lifelong hatred towards his brother Jacob. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit, but he even accuses uh, Esau of destroying the temple. And that was actually Titus the Roman general. But if Titus the Roman general was accused of as being Esau, then clearly by at that point there, God has already identified the Romans, as we would know it today, the Vatican, as being Esau's descendants. Let's look at it in Hebrew, though. It says, Kodeshi. In Hebrew, it literally is in the masculine plural. As you see on your screen there, the shutetem, they shall drink. It is implying that there were only men present at this particular drinking of wine on the mountain. Then it goes on, the holy mountain of God there. See? And they, gender inclusive, plural, will continue to drink. The nations, tamid is to continually. Uh, all the nations shall drink, or all the Gentiles. 
And after this particular official communion service, they continued to drink there on in, or in the upper room. Even was so bold to go actually in the tomb of David itself and do a communion service a couple of week, weeks after Pope Francis left. And at that point, it was gender inclusive, meaning both men and women participated in the communion. But if you back up to what we just looked at here in the video here, Showing you the footage here, the Pope of Rome right here, and I apologize, I did not get the volume adjusted on this correctly here, but the Pope of Rome, there was only men in this particular delegation. And we know this for a fact because it's even stated by the Roman Catholic Church's own website that the only people that participated in that communion were the men, the priests there in the old city, along with the men of the delegation that was from uh, Rome. This is how we can identify the prophecy as being accurate, friends. This is what's so important that we see this. All right, and they shall, and these, and, and excuse me, and they will drink upon my holy mountain, men only in that particular one there. Let's move on. Pope Francis arrives in Israel as a king. This is what's really fascinating right here. Let me real quick, though, just uh, um, I need to bring this volume down for you guys just so we get this going here just right. Um, now, pardon me just a second here. Okay. When the Pope Francis visited Israel, and I believe this was his first time, I wanted you just to see the type of welcome that he got there. It was as if he was royalty himself, like a king. Look at the mass red carpet layout there, Vatican flags flying everywhere. You know, the Pope of Rome, his feet never touches the ground that he doesn't claim full control of that land. And this is exactly what he has done. He has conquered Israel. The popes, of course, were there long before that particular point there. But everyone saluting this man, they're standing there as if their king has arrived. And then, of course, coming out humbly to the Pope of Rome, Shimon Perez, and Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu come out to greet him as royalty, as the king not only of Israel, but the king of the world, is the way this man is received in Israel. It is an absolute deplorable thing that happens here. And even on the carpet here, it's kind of interesting the way it was laid out. You don't see it in this particular video here, but when they laid it out, they set it up in the shape of a cross. And as you can see, they put the Catholic flags there as well. Just unbelievable. Anyway, Joel Bainerman, another part of what he writes here, he writes about Mark Halter. Mark Halter, as you can see pictured here uh, on your screen here, a French intellectual philosopher and a close friend of Prez tells the Israeli weekly magazine Hashishi that, the, that he personally delivered a letter from Perez to the Pope in September of 1993 in which Perez promised to internationalize Jerusalem granting the UN political control, control of the old city of Jerusalem and the Vatican hegemony of the holy sites within. The UN would give the PLO a capital within its new territory and East Jerusalem would become a kind of free trade zone of world diplomacy. Is that not what we see setting up? It didn't go quite as fast maybe as the Vatican was hoping for, but nonetheless it did go exactly that way. Now, since Pope Francis has taken the realm or the head of the Catholic Church, things have progressed extremely fast. The Jesuit, first Jesuit Pope ever. And it doesn't mean that we won't ever have, that we won't have another Pope. It doesn't look like we're going to have enough time to have another Pope, but there's still that possibility. Of course, there's a lot of rumor speculation that Pope Francis will retire, and he very well may. But remember, once a pope retires, there's just another one that takes his place. 
perhaps younger, more charismatic. Who knows? This Pope here is pretty dead gum charismatic as it is there. I want to share with you another, because uh, from that point there, we also see too, uh, this was on The Guardian, Pope Francis meets Obama to begin the unpredictable, uh, uh, not quiet, liberal U.S. tour. This was back in September of 2015, and this is where things really begin to move in high gear. It was very, very concerning. Again, the Pope of Rome greeted like a rock star. In fact, one magazine put it, put it that way. He was greeted like a rock star. This crowds in this video just went nuts over his arrival there. And everywhere the Pope went in the United States, the massive crowds were just unbelievable. And of course, uh, he again has conquered the United States, but it's just strange. He had a, he had a private meeting with uh, Barack Obama, very secret, a very long meeting in fact. Uh, so people have wondered and speculated about what was his meetings about. But, Many other things happened while he was there. Now, the, according to the CNN, um, climate change, Cuba, and poverty are the issues the White House expects uh, to top the agenda with President Barack Obama, uh, who welcomes the Pope Francis on Wednesday. But beyond hot-button politic topics, a senior White House official said the two men enjoy a, rap a rapport that means many different subjects could be raised and should the Pope be so inclined. So there's a lot of things. I know they get big into this climate control thing, which I've, I've, I, as I've stated before, when you look at Psalm 83, the Bible does say that they consulted together. They, they, they're confederate. And I do believe it's not just the Arabic nations there, but the confederacy against Israel is, of course, the Muslim nations. But they were concerned about the hidden ones. Sufanecha is the word hidden in the, in the Hebraic language, and it speaks about the hidden ones that they did counsel about. These are the two witnesses, and this may be why there's a big concern about global change. Now, another thing, I didn't have a chance to bring it up in here, but it seems we have uh, Obama on here and Pope Francis. Barack Obama did say in a recent uh, statement that he made here when he was speaking about uh, climate change after he made the comments there at the United Nations uh, meeting there, or the G20 summit, I forget which one it was, but he made a very strange statement about the seas rising drastically, three or four, uh, excuse me, four or five, six feet, he said. This would be a major problem. He was talking about global climate change and then likened it to terrorism. We did a video a little while back stating how that we do believe that the reason why they're doing this and passing these laws is because they do know the two witnesses are coming. And of course, there's going to be global chaos that will ensue with their ministries because according to Revelation 11, they are going to bring all kinds of plagues upon the earth. And that may be where the sudden climate change comes from. There's a lot of people who believe in Planet X. Maybe there is something to it. I know in the Apocalypse of Thomas, it does speak of the seas rising very rapidly. So that's kind of interesting. What is it that they do know that we don't know? And is it because, as Psalm 83 speaks about, they've consulted against thy hidden ones? Are they really concerned about the two witnesses and what will really happen? Well, that's another subject altogether, so we'll just have to move on. Anyway, the president values hearing from the Pope on a number of issues that they both care about. This continued on the same article. The official said, we expect that the Pope will feel very comfortable bringing up any issues on his mind. Francis arrives in Washington Tuesday for a whirlwind trip that also includes a highly anticipated speech uh, to a joint session of Congress on Thursday. Uh, not to mention his United Nations speech that he did as well. Pope Francis calls on the United Nations to build a universal fraternity, according to Time.com. Uh, and he says the United Nations prophecies bomb Pope Francis dropped that nobody caught. This was what was really interesting right here. This is where he addresses the assembly in his own name. Again, as it was, uh, this was published by Now the End Begins, Dot com, but they noticed as well the prophecy of, in the book of John. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 43 being fulfilled. And of course, we know what that states there. I come in my Father's name, and you receive, <clears throat> and, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. 
Well, look what he says here. The name of Jesus Christ, of whom Francis claims to be the vicar of, was never mentioned one time in any way, shape, or form during his United Nations address. That's what the writer uh, speaks about in here. But then he quotes directly, and this was from the transcript taken from the Vatican's own website, Thank you for your kind words. Once again, following a tradition by which I feel honored, the Secretary General of the United Nations has invited the Pope to address this distinguished assembly of nations. In my own name and that of the entire Catholic community, I wish to express to you, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, my heartfelt gratitude. And it was very interesting that he said, in my own name. It may not be much of anything, but when you do take, for, take in consideration the very words that Yeshua says, which is prophetic in itself, and of course the picture here of Pope Francis is one that we took ourselves in Rome, it says, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. That's exactly, if, if, I, if this prophecy is not being fulfilled in the Pope of Rome right now, I don't know of any prophecy that's ever been fulfilled so accurately. The world has received him fully and completely. But when it comes to Yeshua, when it comes to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being received in this day, people do not want anything to do with that. It is a shame to say the least. He also, as we said, he addressed both houses of Congress. Inside Pope Francis' addresses to Congress, uh, as you see here, pictured uh, with him there, the Vice President uh, Joe Biden in the background, Speaker, the House Speaker as well. Uh, one of the things that he says during this, which was very interesting, the New York Times quotes him, it is important that today, as in the past, the voice of faith continued to be heard. Notice that. The voice of faith continued to be heard. And it's not going to be our faith. It's not going to be what we think or believe. The only faith that he's interested in is what the Catholic Church faith has to say. For it is a voice of fraternity and love, which tries to bring out the best in each person, in each society. And notice he also links not just the individuals, but society, which gives the Vatican the ability to, to rule in a govern governmental way. So, see, you guys lost us on live stream for a little bit. I apologize, and I don't have any way. This will, by the way, will be broadcast on YouTube as well. So uh, you'll always be able to go back there because we won't be able to save its entirety in that case there. Vatican to recognize Palestinian state in new treaty, New York Times, May 13th of 2015. So we see that it begins to roll, the things that are happening. The Vatican is making its push. Remember, Daniel chapter 11 speaks about how that they, he comes up strong with a small people. But you know, it's only after he signs the league. Not the covenant, but the league. And the league, when the league was signed by the Jewish Congress here on December the 3rd. The Bible says at that point there, once he signed that league, he would come up strong with a small people. And the Pope of Rome has been at warp speed now. Since that covenant was signed by the Jewish Congress, the rabbis around the world, now it's not the Knesset, it is the Jewish Congress, which is a body of uh, uh, Orthodox rabbis from all over the world. Fourteen Israeli rabbis signed on with this. And now the Vatican is in warp speed using the small people, which is the Palestinians, to push their agenda forward. Anyway, it says, the New York Times says here, Jerusalem, the Vatican announced Wednesday that it would soon sign a treaty that includes recognition of the state of Palestine, lending significant symbolic weight to the intensifying Palestinian push for international support for sovereignty that bypasses the paralyzed negotiations with Israel. This is very concerning, friends. Uh, according to Reuters, on January 2nd, 2016, a Vatican Accord with Palestine comes into effect. They announced it being a state, and it's not just a, this is not a two-state solution. I've said to you guys many times before, the two-state solution is already done. It's already signed. If the Vatican already controls Jerusalem, it was handed over to, to, to them back in the 90s, Certainly, they got control of everything else that goes on in the state of Israel as well as the West Bank. And remember, according to the Jordanians, they still claim sovereignty over the West Bank. They annexed it in 1950. 
So the Jordanians still have control. This is why the, the Luftwaffe actually controls what goes on on the Temple Mount. Israel doesn't have control of that. And of course, they handed over the old, they handed over the old city to the Vatican. So who has control of anything? It's the Vatican and the Jordanians. This is why you saw the Pope of Rome before coming to Israel, and he didn't go to he went to the he went to the Palestinians first. But before going there, he went to the Jordanians and met with King Abdullah the <clears throat> second. And as we went into a broadcast just the other day, you already know that the prophecies that speak about King Abdullah II and his princes and his priests, they're all going to go into captivity. Why? Because of this evil deal that they have made with the Pope of Rome. To do what? To undermine the children of Israel. God will repay. Now, according to Reuters, it says here, an agreement signed last year making the Vatican's de facto recognition of Palestine in 2012 official has come into effect. The Holy See said on Saturday, the Vatican signed its first treaty with the state of Palestine last June when it called for the moves to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and back a two-state solution. The Holy See and the state of Palestine have notified each other that the Procedural requirements for the Accords entry into force have been fulfilled, the Vatican said in a statement on Saturday. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution in 2012 recognizing Palestine as an observer, non-member state. This was welcomed at the time by the Vatican, which has the same observer, non-member status at the United Nations. Do you know that this is written in your Bible as well, Ezekiel chapter 35. Let's take a look at that. In verse 5, it states here, Because thou hast had a hatred of old, and hast hurled the children of Israel into the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of the iniquity of the end. That's the day you're living in now. This is where Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, where Israel's iniquity is supposed to come to an end. But the Vatican is still throwing the children of Israel at the sword. You realize this is another prophecy that's being fulfilled even in the third intifada as of right now as we speak. And it's funny, this is a problem, not, not funny as ha ha ha, but it is serious, friends. We are talking about Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, is being fulfilled through this third intifada. You, under, you have to understand. Esau hated his brother Jacob, who overcame and was received the name of Israel by the angel of the Lord. But what's interesting in this is that Esau, back in the times of Jacob, he never came against his brother, although he had a right to do, come against him because of what Jacob had deceived him. But he doesn't. They make an amend at that time. It was, it was a prophecy. God says in his word, I have loved Jacob. I hated Esau. And we find out in Ezekiel chapter 35, God clearly gives the prophecy. He says, because thou hast had a hatred of old and hast hurled the children of Israel unto the power of the sword. That's including, in, uh, that, that includes, and we'll go into this in just a minute, and from in the book of Obadiah, that also includes during 70 AD when Israel went into captivity after the destruction of the second temple. Obadiah clearly identifies again Esau as being the one that does that, that destroyed the city and also the sanctuary. And of course, Daniel said that the Messiah would come before the destruction of the second temple. Remember that, my Jewish friends. But he says, the children of Israel unto the power, thou hast hurled the children of Israel unto the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, that's 70 AD, in the time of the iniquity of the end. Do you realize, friends, this is why that the Palestinians are using knives to attack the Jews? It is a sign, it is a prophetic sign to the Jewish people. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, is being fulfilled. The last part of the verse, the time of their calamity was 70 AD. In the time of the iniquity of the end is the day you're living in right now. This is the time of redemption. And they're being thrown at the sword again by who? By Esau, by the Vatican of Rome. Because what does Tehran say? The cardinal who is over the international relationships for, for religious relations, which is Israel? 
He says publicly, not once, twice, he's already said it publicly, there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the holy sites, we get full autonomy for the holy sites and we govern it ourselves. That's paraphrasing it. So they throw you at the sword once again. Prophecy being fulfilled in this day. That's why the knives are being used. This is why you don't see the suicide bombers. Because of the prophecy had to be fulfilled. Not to mention reaping what we sow. Verse 9, skipping down a little bit. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Now God is speaking about Rome. Esau, because thou hast said these two nations, Israel and the Palestinian state that they've already declared, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. Do you know the Vatican itself quotes this, not this verse, but they quote this particular saying from another prophecy in the Bible where it says, whereas the Lord was there, And they claim it for themselves. You see, God had commanded Israel to, you know, or spoke of Israel that the name of the city of Jerusalem would be changed. It would be stated, whereas the Lord was there. That's what the city of Jerusalem would be called. And the Vatican has, has embraced this title for themselves. Why do you think in the prophecy of Ezekiel, God quotes that? Because God knows that the Vatican's going to claim it for themselves. So God's identifying once again who the Vatican really is. He's Esau. So if we drop down, watch what God says in verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. Speaking of Esau, speaking of the Vatican of the Rome. So when is God going to destroy then? When is God going to destroy the Vatican, Rome, for the evils that they've done to Israel? That's easy. My Jewish brethren, you'd have to go to a Christian Bible. Revelation chapter 11, verse 10 tells you when. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. This is the two witnesses in Revelation 11 that's spoken about. They've been killed. Their dead bodies are laying in the street after they've done their three and a half year uh, testimony, bringing out the plagues upon the earth. And the whole earth hates them because of the doctrine that they bring and because they stand up and restore the word of God back to its original uh, way it was when Yeshua was here. No beating around the bush, what they say, they tell it just like it is. So it says here, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. God said he's going to destroy Rome when the earth rejoices. And the only time the earth rejoices is at the death of the two witnesses. So it's at least three and a half years because the witnesses have not started their ministry yet. So if they started tomorrow, we'd have three and a half years before he destroys Rome. So a lot of things are going to happen during that time. But they're going to continue to throw Israel to the sword. At the time, their iniquity had an end. That also tells you that, by the way, do you realize that's another signpost? The fact that the Intifada is using knives against the Jews tells you that the two witnesses are at the, at the point of bringing the gospel of Yeshua to the Jews. Because it's at the time their iniquity has an end. They would be thrown to the sword. But once the two witnesses step on the scene, their iniquity has an end because they recognize who their Messiah is. Let's move on to Obadiah so you know for sure what I'm talking about here. I apologize for the size of this. I forgot to enlarge this. Uh, in Obadiah uh, verse 6, how is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? See, it was Esau. This is Rome. Now watch. We'll identify it. If you drop down to verse 10 in Obadiah. For the violence done to thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Remember, again, he's judged when the earth rejoices. Verse 11, In the day that thou didst stand aloof, in the day that, the, that strangers carried away his substance, talking about Israel, talking about the temple treasures, we know that the Ark of Titus, I should have put that picture up, the Ark of Titus there that is in Italy, right there in the Roman city there, where they celebrate that Titus, a Roman general, took away his substance, the temple treasures, back to, to Rome. Now, I know that there was no Vatican at that time. The point is, it's the descendants of the Romans are Esau's descendants. And this is where the Vatican was created at. 
So it says here, they took, carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even though thou wast as one of them. So God, as the scholars say today, it was not Titus alone, it was the Syrian army that worked with him. And of course, because why? Hadad, who was the sole surviving heir of Esau's descendants, goes into Egypt, raised by uh, the king, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt. When he becomes of age, he marries the Pharaoh's sister's, uh, excuse me, his wife's sister. Those two go into Syria. He becomes the king of Syria. And of course, we see later he has sons. Ben-Hadad is one of his descendants. You know, and there were some decent descendants from Esau because Esau is not all bad, but the very man that killed, ben, that killed Hadad ends up coming and slaughtering and murdering the women and stuff at, during the destruction and dispersion of the house of Israel. We can't get into that right now. But anyway, later, according to the book of Obadiah, Esau's descendants go up into Rome, Italy. Even the Jews have traced this. That's why the Israel to this day still calls, the rabbis still call the Romans Esau, the descendants of Esau. All right, let's continue on here. Now, though, here we have some very interesting things that are happening today in 2016. And these are things that you need to be aware of. Notice right here, in Rome, Knesset head thanks the Pope for urging pilgrimage to the Holy Land. This is the head of the Knesset, which is like the Congress of the United States. He is the leader of the Knesset, has gone and met with the Pope of Rome. Okay. Also, the Pope says Christmas is canceled now that World War III has begun. And this is, uh, on, it was in an article called yournewswire.com. Several articles published. This was on November 22nd of 2015. Pope says Christmas is canceled now that World War III has begun. One of the statements in the article reads, Speaking at a mass at the Casa Santa Maria, the Pope said, We are close to Christmas. There will be lights. There will be parties, bright trees, even nativity scenes. All decked out while the world continues to wage war. It's all a charade. The world has not understood the way of peace. The whole world is at world war, he said grimly. What you're going to see next, though, is what really shocked me. The IMF head, Christine Lagarde, meets with the Pope Francis again, it says. What is the head of the IMF meeting with the Pope for? That's not just that she met with the Pope of Rome. We're talking about the International Monetary Fund. She is the head of the International Monetary Fund. We're talking about world um, economics on the board, uh, brink of collapse. For them to be meeting with the Pope of Rome, is he taking over the world's economic system? We know Pope Benedict's talked about that the Vatican should take control of the world's economics and they should be the head of it. It's under Pope Benedict what he said. Now here's what's interesting in all that. Let me just state one thing too. I've had several people write me about, they said, Steve, you predicted that January 16th, the whole world's economic system would come to an end. I never predicted anything like that. But what has happened, we have had many people that copy my videos and place them on their own channels. And we did find out that somebody had even taken our name of our channel and called it their channel, Israeli News Live. Now, we did write them and told them not to use our name. Then we found out that they had published one of my videos, but they named it that the world economic system will collapse on January 16th of 2016. I never stated anything. There's not a single video where I ever state any prediction of when the world will collapse. But a lot of people look at the title of that video and say, well, you did this. It's not my channel. You can look and see this is not our channel. Our channel is Israeli News Live that has about 51,000 subscribers on it. We don't have any other channel. We do have a couple of small channels that are out there, but they're teaching. They have nothing to do. I shouldn't say a couple. I have one other channel that is a teaching. The other channel that I have was when we were in business before. We had a YouTube channel for our moving business from years ago. But that's all we have. And I've given permission for people to copy our videos, but I do not give permission to put all kinds of outlandish titles on there. We gave permission for people to copy the videos in the event that this channel ever was shut down, at least that people could still hear the things that we've said. 
So, no, we never, and I will say, though, it looks like the economy is collapsing regardless, but nonetheless, I will not take credit for something that I never said. All right, so anyway, Pope Francis meets with the IMF uh, uh, head there, but here's what's even more concerning here, is not only did he meet with her, with Christine Lagarde, but he also, he met with, uh, she introduced him, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, the two leaders previously met in the Vatican in December of 2014 to speak about issues regarding Europe's economic afflictions. Lagarde introduced Pope Francis to some of her collaborators. Sean Hagen, he is the IMF director of the legal department. Why is the lawyer there? Are they setting up a whole new world currency under a new world order? Is this why the Pope of Rome met back in September 23rd, uh, excuse me, 24, 15, September 23rd with the United States meeting with, or speaking with the United Nations, speaking with uh, both houses of Congress, meeting with privately with Barack Obama? I want to read to you something here directly off the IMF uh, website here because I want you to see what it states here about Sean Hagan. He is a general counsel and director of the legal department at the International Monetary Fund. In this capacity, Mr. Hagen advises the fund's management, ex executive board, and the membership on all legal aspects of the fund's operations, including its regulatory advisor and lending functions. Mr. Hagen has published extensive on both the law of the fund and broad range of legal issues relating to the, to the prevention and resolution of financial crisis with a particular emphasis on insolvency and the restructuring of debt, including sovereign debt. Now you know why he's meeting with the Pope of Rome, because they're under a financial crisis. And he has a particular emphasis on insolvency and the restructuring of debt. They're there to meet with the Vatican to restructure the world's debt. Now that's my thought on it. Why else would this legal man be meeting with the Pope of Rome as well? The Times of Israel on January 19th of 2016 reported this here. Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein met Sunday with Pope Francis in Rome. By the way, we'd already mentioned this, but there was something, I guess I got it out of order here, I apologize for that, and thanked him for strengthening the ties between the Catholics and Jews, for encouraging Christian pilgrimage to Israel. He says, your call for pilgrimage to, to the land of Israel is extremely important, Edelstein said. It will certainly bring massive tourism that will contribute to Israel's economy for the benefit of the Jews and Arabs alike, and this may lead to the stability and calm. Doesn't look like the Palestinians are ready for calm. But then again, they will stop when the Pope says stop. You see, the Pope tells the world when to fight and when not to fight. What he says publicly is one thing, what he says privately is another. He's also due to meet uh, the president of Iran, Rouhani, this month. I'd love to be there when he does, but of course nobody knows when he's going to, so I guess I won't get to be there. And of course you couldn't be there, and all you could do is see him go in. That'd be, that'd be the, about the most you'd get to see, but it'd be nice to just to be able to see that and cover that. But here was the other thing that really very huge issue. Google's, Google's Eric uh, Schmidt met with the Pope Francis at the Vatican. This is according to NBC on January 15th of 2016. And all it says here, although Francis has admitted he doesn't know how to work a computer and has called the internet a gift from God, he is no stranger to the Google products. The 79-year-old pontiff has hosted two Google Hangouts from the Vatican, including one which he confessed he's a dinosaur when it comes to, the, to, to technology. Why does he meet with Google? Perhaps setting up some guidelines on what they will do and what they won't do. It's interesting to say the least there. I'd like to share with you though something as we close in this broadcast that Joel Bainerman said. Again on his article, uh, which is actually by Jerry uh, Chomish on his website there, but he's quoting Barry, uh, Joel Bainerman. How does the Vatican view the legitimacy of Israel's claim to Jerusalem? The Vatican, excuse me, now, excuse me, they know, which is the Vatican, they know this is, isn't the end of the story that the Jewish God had in mind, but that doesn't mean they won't try to engineer their own. This is what Joel Bainerman was showing us. 
This is back in the 90s. Joel Bannerman knew that they were going to try to engineer their own idea. I wonder if Joel Bannerman would have known of Daniel 11, the prophecy there in verse, uh, what was it, verse 14, where the lawless will try to marry the vision. I wonder if he knew that that was there. I doubt it. But perhaps if Joel would have seen some of these prophecies, he might have been able to see just exactly how Satan works in the background. So he says here that they're going to engineer their own ending to the story. So what is it? What if it is fraudulent? Does uh, doesn't matter? That is their game plan. And that is what matters, and that is what Israeli Jews need to be to to be better informed about. It is important for everyone to know that the Vatican, uh, excuse me, know what the Vatican has up its sleeve, because it directly relates to our existence and our future destiny as an independent nation. Speaking of Israel. This is a very powerful force that is scheming to get control of the, holy, the old city of Jerusalem. So you better know why and how the Vatican intends to do this. Once you have all the facts and the chronology recorded, you will be better informed to deal with the issue and a foreign control over Israel's political existence and destiny. Joel was murdered. And I can see why. Because he spoke out. But Joel, they've already gotten control of it. Sad to say. Obadiah says something interesting, though, and I'd like to share that with you. It says, And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, Rome, and the kingdoms shall be the Lord's. In other words, after the testimony of the two witnesses, then God will restore the kingdom back to him to the Lord. Then the Messiah will rule for a thousand years. Those saviors are none other than the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation 11.3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. My friends, I just got one question for you. Are you still looking for an antichrist? Or do you need to look any further? He is united. Even the charismatic leaders back under his authority. He has united the Muslim world. Everything that Joe Bainerman spoke about, and Joe Bainerman didn't look at this from a prophetic side, he was only looking at it from a journalistic side. Guglielmiati has done a very good job at trying to bring these things out as well. Joel saw what was coming. Biblically, it's everywhere. It's only a matter of time. Remember the prophecy in Ezekiel. The time that their iniquity was to come to an end. That's speaking of Daniel chapter 9, where it also speaks about the prince that shall come. Remember the prince that shall come in Daniel chapter 9 was of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. That's just paraphrasing it, of course, but... He's of those people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. That was none other than Titus, the Roman general. So the prince that shall come will come out of Rome. Again, do you need to look any further for an antichrist? The prince that shall come comes out of Rome, according to Daniel's prophecy. And this is also at the time when their iniquity shall have an end. That's what Daniel speaks about as well. Israel's iniquity comes to an end when the two witnesses come to reveal who the Messiah is. And they also bring judgment on Rome. Think about the time we're living in, friends. You're seeing Ezekiel 35 being fulfilled before your eyes. Because the Bible said they threw them at the sword. At the time of their destruction... The destruction of the, excuse me, I'm just paraphrasing. Let me, let me just back up to that real quick for you. I really want you to see this one last time. Because that truly is Bible prophecy. It's right here. Ezekiel 35, I'm sorry, I went one too many. Because thou hast had a hatred of old, and hast hurled the children of Israel unto the power of the sword... In the time of their calamity, 70 A.D., in the time 
of the iniquity of the end. The third intifada is the power of the sword. Your two witnesses are about to arrive. I'm Stephen Benoon. You are watching Israeli News Live, our prophetic segment of our broadcast. God bless you. Thank you for watching on live stream as well. You can join us there. Look up Stephen Benoon on live stream. Follow us there. Be glad to have you live. And as well, if you had any problems on live stream, you can go catch this broadcast on Israel excuse me, Israeli News Live on YouTube to catch the whole broadcast here within the next hour or so. Shalom. Good evening.